So, uh, Rich? Uh, yes. Uh, I just want to let you know, and I, I don't know if this is a good spot, but we do have a couple sure. questions. So, good, um, great. Yeah. Is this okay to, to break in here? Or? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. cool. I'm going to I'm going to turn on Marcos. Marcos has a a, a question. He has a microphone and a camera. Marcos, Great. you should be all set now if you say something. Hello there. Hi, Hi. Marcos. Uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity, Rich, and uh I would like to ask a question regarding the fight against entropy you mentioned yes. on Ubik. I am just reading uh Do and Write Dreams of a Magic Sheep. And I sense there is a connection on that subject, and I would like to know if you can expand it a little longer, please. Yes, I, I think it's a very appropriate uh, uh, comment because um, one of the things that both Durandbury's Dream of Electric Sheep and Ubik have in common is this um, disorientation in what is alive and what is dead. It's almost like a new form of disorder comes into being, a new form of entropy comes into being, when we can no longer give a yes or no answer to the question of whether or not something is alive or not, right? So the void comp test in Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is attempting to differentiate a living system from a uh, machinic system, but it, it fails, right, in the case of uh, Rachel Deckard, uh, Rachel, uh, What's Rachel Bless? Rosen. Rachel Rosen. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this form of entropy, this form of disorder is also at play in Ubik because one of the fundamental unknowns in Ubik is who is alive and who is dead. So it's almost as if the technological progress in the novel of cryonics or in Dwendrick's Dream of Electric Sheep, the creation of humanoid androids, um, creates new form of entropy even as it creates a new form of order, right? We certainly would agree that the ability to stabilize a living body uh, by putting it into a frozen state and reviving it periodically is a new form of order. But along with that comes a new form of entropy, which is that we can't figure out who's alive and who's dead in the novel. Same thing in Duedroy's Dream of Electric Sheep. Now, there's another wonderful Dickian uh, concept and word uh, into Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which is Kipple, yeah, which is Dick's idea that the world is sort of gradually being covered in like basically junk, you know. Uh, and here he's really interestingly uh, prescient about, for example, so-called junk DNA in our own uh, DNA that, that over time we kind of acquire uh, bits of uh, nucleic acids that aren't necessarily functional. Now, I agree with those scientists who think that we're being very premature in calling that junk DNA, but this is the, this is the kind of to and fro that Dick is engaged in, and this is what gives the conflict and drama to his novels, which is sometimes it looks like the forces of disorder are just like, you know, inexorably going to win. You know, the whole world is going to be covered in uh, Kipple or we're never again going to be able to differentiate someone who's alive from someone who is dead, basically, in, in these novels. But at the same time, you always have the force of love and the force of consciousness in these books, which kind of drive the quest. Like, why does uh, Deckard care at all about who Rachel Rosen is? He falls in love with this being that he can't differentiate from, uh, from being a machine or a living organism. Or in uh, Ubik, uh, Joe Chip's kind of quest, his you know, walking up the stairway, right, is powered by this kind of desire to overcome entropy. Where does that desire to overcome come from? I would suggest that Dick is exploring the ways in which that desire to overcome uh, entropy is the very kind of impetus of human consciousness. That that's what human consciousness is. It's the response to entropy in the world. Uh, does that address some of what you're querying, or do you have a follow-up? No, oh, that's exactly oh. right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and in fact, I think it cuts across other novels as well, and um, when we get to the exegesis in particular, it'll become an interesting thing to keep track of, because again, 
Dick is almost always of multiple minds about these things, but that's what gives us some conflict. Thank, thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Great question. Do you have time for one more in here? Sure, uh, yeah, of course. I'm going to go to Jason. Jason, you're on. Yes, Mr. Doyle, you mentioned the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about that. Is that a is that a text that you read through academically, or is it something that you engage in with uh, meditation and recitation? Myself, you mean? You're asking yeah, about yourself myself. or in general. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's a kind of it's an instruction manual. I haven't myself uh, um, used it uh, as a kind of uh, chanting device, as a kind of uh, something that I use on my consciousness. Uh, you probably know that Timothy Leary and Ralph Metzner and a few others revised uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a way of guiding us through psychedelic experience. I think what's interesting about the so-called Tibetan Book of the Dead is it's the Bardo Thodol is that it is really a technique of addressing our consciousness directly, right? So, for example, in the English translation, it starts off, hey, you, immortal one, right? And if we read that, it, it does what I was pointing to earlier in terms of the Atma Vichara. It turns our consciousness around at itself and says, hey, is that me? You're talking to me? I'm the immortal one? Is there something immortal in me? Right? And so it's a kind of, um, it's not so much uh, a content that we give to our brain, like information that we give to our brain, as it is a way of informing ourselves, right? It literally changes us to read it. So um, I think in general, a lot of these texts, um, like the Barna Todal or a text that I'm working with right now, the Ribu Gita, um, also the Bhagavad Gita is very powerful in this way. They are powerful poetic techniques for altering our consciousness. And for the most part, the scholarship and academic treatment of these texts sort of avoid that, right? You know, like some of the more powerful uh, texts I've ever read is the Upanishads, right? You read the Upanishads, and for me personally anyway, I slap myself on the forehead, and I, you know, I can't believe them. They're incredibly effective texts. But for the most part, when you read academic discourse about these texts, they completely remove them from the realm of practice and treat them as artifacts to be studied like fossils. And to me, they're living practices that if you want to even begin to understand them, you have to engage them. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. I tried to read through it myself, but it just like you mentioned, it calls on you to engage in it because, yeah, just trying to read through it academically, you missed the point. So thanks for clarifying on that. Well, you know, it's funny, though, because there's texts in the West that are like that, too. For example, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, which is like one of the great works of Western philosophy. If you read academic texts on it, they sort of abstract it and try to explain what he is doing. But you have to do it. It would be like the distinction between doing a Pilates class and describing what is going on in a Pilates class, right? So, yeah, I encourage you to keep doing that because um, we have, you know, there's these archives of these texts that they're very powerful. And um, they don't necessarily have to be powerful for any esoteric or mystical way just because, but the writers understood how to focus our consciousness on our consciousness. And that's something that we very much need to do. So thank you, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, you, Jason. Okay, that's all I have for now, Rich. Thanks.